We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a topic, topic from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Brian. What games, board, and RPG are produced by Native Americans First Nation creators? I'm particularly interested in game experiences from the Native American First Nations perspective versus mm -hmm. the typical view through the lens of colonialism. First off, thank you very much, Brian, for the awesome question. This is a good one. Um, but before we get to the list of games I was able to find, I do have a few things I want to say first. So first off, during this segment, I will be using the term native and indigenous fairly interchangeably. Now, Brian himself is a Native American. Neither Sean or I are in any part whatsoever. Um, I have heard that indigenous peoples is currently the most accepted term to use, but that many people still also recognize and use the term native. I am well aware that some other terms have been used over the years and don't plan to go that route. Just please realize that we do mean all respect to these creators and the games they have made. Similarly, as language and understandings change, what we say here today, we mm -hmm. understand may not remain appropriate. We happily invite comment and discussion on these topics and our use of the language to help and promote others without voices. All right, next, I have to express my disappointment. Um, this is based on how hard it was to find the games I did find for our list tonight, for our topic tonight. Now, when Brian first asked this question a couple weeks ago on our Discord channel, I fully expected to find a significant number of games designed by Indigenous people. Like, not a ton, but, like, enough that... I, I'd be able to get like a top 10, right? There'd be enough to pick from that I, I could find the best indigenous games. And like, I knew of a couple off the top of my head, like at least two that, that I know about well. And I went digging, expecting to find more. And I'm sorry to say, I was only able to find about a dozen games in total. Like in all board gaming and role playing. And to even to get to 12, I had to include some very, very old games to get to that number. Now, what I did find is a rather large number of games about Indigenous people. Uh, it's a very popular topic, especially with the Old West, many of which seem to handle First Nations culture well and appropriately. So there are enough games out there about Natives that seem to be handled well, but most of them are designed by German and Italian game designers. And almost none of them appeared to hire any indigenous consultants. Now, I will admit it is hard to find that information right now. It's not consultants aren't always listed. It'd be nice if they were. But as far as I could tell, um, the vast majority of uh, like even award winning games didn't seem to have any consultation involved. Now, for example, I found the names Michael Kiesling and Wolfgang Kramer on a number of award winning modern and abstract games with indigenous themes. Now, these are designers I enjoy their non-indigenous themed games quite a bit um and the ones i have played that are indigenous themes are, are solid as well like these are award-winning spiel de jar like golden geek nominated games and it seems like this pair enjoy that theme right I, I don't know what historical research they did and they also do seem to handle it um responsibly so they have games ranging from the aztecs to the native american pueblo tribes of the zuni and the hopi but nowhere could I find any indication that Michael Kiesling or Worthley and Kramer ever worked with any actual indigenous peoples. Now, I'm not necessarily saying they didn't. I just couldn't find evidence of that. Now, what I did find is a very large number of games that didn't handle native history or native issues well at all. But that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. We're going to keep this on the positive. Yeah, sadly, poor handling of such topics has been prevalent for so many cultures and peoples. And it's something we hope in our small way to help through giving a voice to these mm -hmm. games. Now, due to how few games I did find, I decided I had to expand on Brian's original question. So I, I broadened the scope of my research to include games by any indigenous designer instead of limiting it specifically to the Americas. Now, overall... I just hope the situation improves and that the recent success of a couple of modern games on our list tonight will open the doors for a new wave of indigenous, native, First Nation designers and games. Finally, I do want to apologize in advance for any mispronunciations of the game names. Sadly, Board Game Geek does not have a pronunciation guide and finding one online uh, for any of these game names led me to different results. I would go to various pronunciation guides and they would all say completely different things. So uh, just please know that I tried. Well, now on to the list of games we were able to find. We've broken this list down into four sections. First off, we have some historic games, 
older games that are still played today. This mm-hmm. is followed by modern hobby games, which we divided into a group of board games and a group of RPGs. Finally, we've got some honorable mentions. Other than these groupings, the games are in no particular order. Mm-hmm. Now, another thing to note is that due to colonialization, many of the rules for these historical games come to us by way of German or English game historians, Mm -hmm. often taken from records brought back from overseas by explorers or other colonial institutions (laughs) uh, with imperfect understanding and not from the records of the people themselves in many cases, unfortunately. Yes. Now, let's start with some much older games, including one very popular game that I don't think many people realize have native has native origins. All right, that's not our first game on our list. The first game I have on our list is a game called Patuli. Or Patuli. This is a two-player board game that was created by Aztecs. Patuli means kidney bean. And when originally discovered by Spanish conquistadors, the players of Patuli were using the beans like dice. They would throw the beans to figure out, and depending on what side of the bean was up, it would mean something. The players roll their beans, and based on what they rolled, they will place tokens on the board or move existing tokens, with the goal being to get your tokens from your side of the board to the opposite side of the board. Now, on the board, uh, which is actually like a big cross, there are some spots that are safe, but others that are not. And if your opponent lands on your beam when it's on one of the unsafe spots, they eat the beam. Now, this is recognized as one of the oldest board games ever discovered in America. Some people claiming it's the first board game discovered in America. Now, this was discovered in in 1350, but that's just, again, like Sean mentioned, when the colonialist found the game and reported in its existence back home. It's probably existed for many years beyond that. Now, uh, recently, as, uh, as recently as 2011, an archaeological dig discovered what they believe is a Patoli board inscribed on the building nice. that they were uh, excavating. And they placed the date for that between 600 and 900 A.D. Oh, Excellent. So yeah, I, I just, like I said, that was my theory. And I think that's going to be the case for all of these games. Um, I'm going with dates that were listed on Board Game Geek, but like, again, those are going to be the dates that they were recorded in history, probably not the dates that the games came from. Now, a big part of Patoli was gambling. This was a gambling game. And most games were played for some form of treasure. And remember, we're going back to the Aztec time period here. So some of that treasure meant other people. There was actually a time when the invading Spanish priests banned the game due to the fact that people were selling themselves and their families into slavery over a game of Patoli. Yeah, interestingly, one of the main draws of the game was that if you managed to roll an edge on one of your beans, you won, period. (laughs) Game over, regardless of your opponent's position in the game. And that was Patoli. All right, up next... I've got Dudo, or Yo Dudo, or I Doubt. This one also has South American um, roots, with the earliest mention of the game supposedly coming up in 1800. This is a game that I'm pretty sure everyone listening knows about, and you could go to Walmart right now and pick up a copy. Or if you've got D6s at home, you can just go download the rules. This is the one I had no clue had indigenous origins. Dudo is nowadays known as Liar's Dice. I had no clue that's where this game come from. came from. That was the big surprise of doing my research today. And one of my copies of Liar's Dice is actually right behind me. You can see it in camera. Well, and that was Dudo. Next one I had not heard of, and that is Zon Ah. Now, where our last two games were dice, or, well, bean-based gambling, this next game is not. This is actually a family game. It's actually documented that this game was mostly played by the women and girls of the Kiowa Indians of North, Af- North America, Sorry, where this game started before spreading to other cr- tribes. Uh, There are reports of this game being played by the Navajo, the Kiris, and the Zuni, with each having their own names for the game. But you know what? I'll toss the names in the blog post version of this. I don't even want to try to pronounce these. I apologize. (laughs) Now, Zana is a horse racing game where the player's horses, represented by sticks, race around a circular board made of 40 stones. Players would take three sticks and throw them at the, a striking stone that was in the center of the board. And depending on where they landed after bouncing off the striking stone, that would be how far their, their horses move. So this is Creek Wood, literally translated from Zon Al. 
often confused and mistaken with other Native American games, though. And that was an interesting thing in the in the research I was doing on this game is that historians have have really struggled with a lot of these Native American games because they were similar in many ways and right. would get clumped together often. All right, up next is Puluk, which is an abstract strategy war game for two players. This originated with the Ketchy Indians of Guatemala. Uh, as the game spread, it did start to be known by other uh, names like Bull or Bool or Bulik. Um, most popular nowadays seems to be Bool. Like if you Google Bool board, you should be able to find copies that you can buy nowadays of Pulik. A note uh, I discovered, some authors... Uh, speculate that the game may actually be Mayan in origin as the Kechi themselves are descendants of the Mayan peoples. So you go, yet another instance of first documented time, but the game probably existed for a long time before that. So this game is based on a board with 21 spaces all in a row, like basically, basically a bunch of lines and it'd be you're on the line or you're between the line. The players each have five warrior pieces and the goal is to capture the opponent's warriors. Now there are five official variations of this game and in modern play whenever you play like in a tournament or something the goal is to play all five of these one after each other with the overall winner of your game being whoever got the best three out of five now these game types in english are the ant the eagle the scorpion warrior ant and fire now the originally this game was playing with corn grains and corn stalks to make up the board and the game has come a long way since then um, put it this way, this is one of the more modern ones because there's an app for this. You can find any number of different copies of Pulik on the App Store. Well, and that was Pulik, uh, and I should just note again, as Mo was saying, there really appeared to be a lot of different house rulings on this one out there from uh, historical and modern. All right, next up we have Kalois Awalonene better known here as Fighting Spirits. Serpents, sorry, Fighting Serpents. Uh, this one comes from the Zuni Indians of New Mexico who took the game Alquerque, which is a version of Checkers, possibly the actual version of Checkers, that the Spaniard invaders were playing and decided to make their own version. Good on them. To play this game, all you need is a board, stones, or pottery pieces. Um, sorry, all you need is a board. Stones and pottery pieces were often used as playing pieces. Um, all you needed is to have two different colors. Now, being based on something like checkers this is of course similar to drafts where you're trying to capture all of your opponent's pieces capturing is done by jumping over an opponent's piece and captures are mandatory now the board though is quite different from checkers consisting of three rows of spaces connected by diagonal lines as well as having a terminus point on each end that's connected to the other rows by curves uh, this is another one that you can still find people playing today. It's the kind of thing you go to a woodworking show. People may have a board there. You will see fighting serpents fairly common even today. And uh, this is one where the pronunciation guides had so many different options. So I'm going to say it was Kolawis Awitlenene, or fighting serpents. I think we'll just stick to fighting serpents. <laughs> Sticking with difficult to pronounce names for us white boys, uh, I next have... Tununu Vupi. This is the final game on my list. This is a two-player abstract game that's also similar to Checkers or Drafts. Actually, this one looks like someone took a checkerboard and turned it 45 degrees. It's all played on diagonals. Uh, this was first played and created by the Hopi Native Americans of Arizona. Now, similar to the last game on the list, all you need is a board and some form of playing pieces, 20 per player, in two different colors. Again, usually bits of stone, bead, or pottery. Now, traditional boards were always carved on flat rocks. So, for some reason, they, they tended to do this in rocks, though there was one evidence where someone found it carved into a beam in a house, which I still don't understand how they could have been playing, or if they were just like, they were a fan of the game, so they put some art above their, on, on their hearth, I don't know. Um... Again, this is basically um, a, a checker style game where you're going to try to capture all the opponent's pieces, though there's a huge debate online for fans of this game whether jumping is mandatory or not. And the reason for that is this has a rule, and the problem is I couldn't find a board to show this rule in, in play, and I, probably if I had had more time I could have dug deeper, but it has to do with the fact where if any row or column is completely empty, you can no longer use a co that column anymore. So the board continues to shrink as you capture more and more pieces, which sounded really fascinating. Um, and then the theme of this is you are going to war, but you're taking each other's territory. Um, 
and what it was was the blank spaces rec- represented you settled. There were now people in those homes, so they're no longer fighting. And I thought that sounded really interesting. But like I said, I had a lot of difficulty. Like if I image search it, there's all kinds of different boards and trying to find exactly how that you can't use this part of the board anymore mechanic worked. And I didn't have much luck. Interesting. Well, that was Tundana Whoopi or something like, like that. that. I apologize again. Yeah, that our, one was rough. Uh, any um, like listeners. I said, Tununu Vupi was the, the, the one I saw, but it was said quicker, like Tununu Vupi. Well, that was the last of our historical games from various <laughs> indigenous peoples and tribes. Now let's move on to some modern hobby games, starting off with a few RPGs. All right, the first one I have to call out is Coyote and Crow. Um, this is a role playing game that is currently live on Kickstarter that has raised over $1 million and is actually the inspiration for this entire topic. Uh, it was Brian's discovery of Coyote and Crow and him pointing it out to us on the Discord that got him to start wondering, hey, what other games are made by, by uh, Native Americans? Now, Coyote and Crow is a science fantasy role-playing game set in an uncolonized future. Instead of extrapolating what happens from now into the future and coming up with Star Wars or whatever, I'd say Star Wars was a long time ago, coming up with Star Trek, uh, Coyote and Crow looks at the sci-fi future where the colonization of America never happened. And what you end up with instead is a world of spirituality and science. And this world was created and led by a team of Native Americans representing more than a dozen indigenous tribes. Everything about this game looks fantastic. The world, the design work, the artwork, even the price is reasonable. You're looking at $50 for the hardcover and PDF together. This is one game on the list. Like if you're going to sit here tonight and listen to this and go, oh, I got to check something out. I want to check out at least one indigenous game. I want to do my due diligence. I recommend checking out Coyote and Crow. That's the one that I think is is the most interesting. And, and right now, the biggest voice, which is important. All right, well, and that is Coyote and Crow up now on Kickstarter. Next, I have Erdragor. This is a game created by a black American Indian game designer who promises a game that reflects Native experiences and how Native storytelling is completely different from standard Western narratives. Now, one important part of this is the concept of Indian time. Had I had more time, I probably would have dove into that, but it's a rather fascinating topic that you can search up on your own. Now, similar to Coyote and Crow, one of the big things here removed from the background is the whole idea of colonizers. There was This is a non-colonial world where nine tribes must survive against horrible things that walk the land. Yes, this game has a strong horror element to it. Now... There's a world of cultures, myths, legends, magic is everywhere. People can bend reality to their world will or break it and unleash more terrible things. And you're playing through this city that's set on the Mississippi called Twain. It just, it looks really cool. Now, mechanically, it's based on the popular Fate Core system. So Sean and I are most familiar probably with Ironet Accelerated. But note, this is Fate Core, not Fate Accelerated. So this would probably be a little thicker. And I got to say, it's a nice, thick looking rule book. And that was Edragor or Ed- Edragor. All right, next up, I've got to thank Twitter for pointing me toward the games of Mercedes Acosta, who is an indigenous trans femme from the Taino Nation. They are a kid literature creator, a kid literature illustrator, a graphic illustrator, and editor that you can find on Itch.io. Now, two of their RPGs are currently available. One is Los Arables, a mini horror RPG about being lost in the woods that it's played in a single session lasting an hour or less. It's very reasonably priced. But more interesting is a game called What Happened. This is a missing person's horror tabletop roleplay about spiritual danger, cosmic encroachment, and inevitability. And those were the RPG games of Mercedes Acosta. Unfortunately, that was all we were able to find in regard to tabletop RPGs from indigenous creators. We're going to move on now to board games. All right, up first I've got Potlatch, a card game about economics. This is a strategic educational card game based on indigenous philosophies that was developed as a community work, sorry, as a community effort with local elders and language experts in the Salish tribes of the Pacific Northwest. 
This game is presented in both English and the local La Chute, La, sorry, La Chute Seed languages. Potlatch features a cooperative game mechanic that are based on sharing resources to meet the needs of others in the form of food, materials, knowledge, and technology. Now, the victory condition of this game, all players win if all of the players have all their needs satisfied by the end of the game. And I gotta say, that right there is such a different victory condition than a thousand games in my collection. Yeah, it's interesting. And, I, and some of the... Um information i know about those particular tribes in that particular area resource gathering was a major part of their life uh right. in in a, in a way that ne wasn't necessarily uh the same in other regions where resources were more uh you know, around where there were more resources to have uh mm -hmm. it was a resource rare area and so that so balancing uh diet and things and, and time spent Right, uh, collecting diet was a major thing. So it's it's interesting that from that region comes a game of this nature, yeah. Uh, and that was potlatch. Yeah, it's fascinating because it's all about sharing. It's all about passing your stuff to the right people so that everyone's fulfilled. Next, I have Nunami. This is recently kickstarted, um, just in 2020. It's from a native Canadian, Tamasi Magniak. This is a hex-based abstract strategy game in which the players work with nature to improve their influence with respect to the others. So players must score points while maintaining a balance between man and nature. Uh, this is a really unique twist on abstract strategy and area control. It has to do with putting out hex boards and then playing triangle, triangle, triangular shape, triangle. Hex, I guess when you put triangles on a hexagon, they become triangle. I don't know. You put triangle cards onto these hexes and then when the hexes are full, you score them, but it's all about balance where you can't go too far to, uh, there's a purple and a blue color and you can't go too far to either side. It just looks really interesting way to do it. And at this point, this is the highest rated game on the list tonight based on Board Game Geek, though I do have to admit it doesn't have a lot of ratings, so I don't know if that's skewed one way or another. Uh, to be honest, like I said, Coyote and Crow is the one you should all check out, but if you're looking for a board game specifically, this is the one I'm most interested to try myself. Like, Coyote and Crow looks fascinating, it looks brilliant, I want to support it, but I'm not playing a role-playing game anytime soon, and I have a huge pile to get through. This looks like something I want to get on my table this weekend. All right, and that was Nunami. Next, I have Orang Rimba, the Forest Keeper. Uh, sadly, this is the last modern board game for our list. Uh, this was published in 2017 by Angrinini Pawati, a native Indonesian. In this game, players play members of the Orang Rimba tribe, which are natives of Bukidua, Bellas Natural Park, and Jambi. Uh, this is a tribe that normally and for centuries lived harmoniously with nature, having just enough provided for themselves to thrive without ever overstretching themselves. That was until illegal loggers arrive in the scene. Now the goal here is to fulfill your family goals, to collect everything your family needs, despite external influences. So this reminds me of spirit island is always always hyped as a great non-colonialism game well here's a game that takes the colonialism on the face it's like it's a big part of the game but it's from the present or from the perspective of the the indigenous peoples in this case this one unfortunately has one rating on board game geek and that's it and i'm not sure where you would even be able to find a copy of it but the concept sounded fascinating and again from a, a an indigenous designer from that tribe so i thought that was also fascinating you're going to get that tribe's perspective and that was orang rimba the forest keeper well that's it for our short list of board games from indigenous designers we do have a handful of honorable mentions as well Mo will mm -hmm. point out why these games didn't end up on the main list as we get to each one all right my first honorable mention is the board game inuit the snow folk this was just published in 2019 to quite a bit of acclaim. Now, the reason this game didn't make the main list is it's not directly designed by anyone native. That said, the designers here did actually hire three Inuit consultants, which they worked on through the whole development of this, of this game. So not designed, but at least had the consultation there. 
Now, the other aspect that I thought was rather pleasing about this particular game was that these new designers actually took an older game called Natives, published in 2017, which at the time was considered to be culturally insensitive in many ways. They took this culturally insensitive game, hired the consultants, worked with the consultants to produce a game that was much more culturally considerate. And I have to applaud them just for that. So I'm giving it an honorable mention because it wasn't actually designed by a native, but at least they took the proper steps to get the consulting and to make sure the game was appropriate. Well, this is a new... Uh... <laughs> I've never had Zoom drop you down to a thumbnail before. Oh, what the heck? <sighs> Uh, well, I'm back. Yep, yep, you're back now. <sighs> That's terrible with this stupid, this is a good topic. And I, that I, was Inuit, the snow folk. Next item on my list is a resource instead of a specific game, which is why I didn't put it on the main list because it wasn't a specific game. And this is a website, nativeteachingaids.com, native teaching aids, all one word. This features a number of educational games created by natives for natives. Uh, their shop includes a large number of regional history games on various different tribes, as well as light games translated into different native languages. Now these light games, uh, I think might push the limits of copyright a bit because they do seem like they're just variations on Uno and Go Fish and playing cards. But it is cool to see them translating popular mass market style games to different languages. Now, in addition to this, a big part of that website is to bring back original languages and to keep them going. And the games that are really neat in this series, there are a series of conversation games and phrase builder games, as well as flashcards for teaching native languages. Now, I gotta say, these probably aren't much interest to hobby board gamers, which I realize is most of our audience, but I think it's awesome to see tribes using gaming as a way to pass on their heritage. And that was the games of nativeteachingaids.com. Finally, I have a game from indigenous designer, Elizabeth Lepensi, who is Anishinaabe, with family from Bay Mills, Métis, and Irish. She worked on a number of games as both a designer, consultant, and artist. Now, most of her work is digital. She did a bunch of video games and apps, but she did produce one board game called The Gift of Food. Now, The Gift of Food is a board game about Northwestern native foods that was published by the Northwest Indian College as a way for Pacific Northwest native communities to pass on cultural teachings about where to gather food and medicines to the fact that it has a map of the area and it would have hints like go past the mountains in this and you'd have to memorize these routes and be able to, to explain how you would get the food and medicine you need. Now, the reason this game did not make the list is this is not something you can go out and get. You can't just go buy this game. This game is being directly distributed to the Pacific Northwest Native communities by the Northwest Indian College. Now, this game sounds fascinating. Uh, like, of all the games I've read, this is one that sounds really neat. The, the production quality is really well done. And just the theme of it sounds cool. Like, like learning landmarks and learning how to find different types of food and making sure when you come back from a journey, you have a balance of the food and medicines your family needs. That sounds excellent. I, I think it'd be great if this was more widely distributed. It seems like the kind of game and the kind of theme that may be interesting for more than just people in the Pacific Northwest Native communities. And that was The Gift of Food. Well, that's it for our introductory list of games by Indigenous designers. We're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has questions. All right, lobbyists, now that you've heard what we were able to come up with, do you have anything to add? Uh, I noticed that uh, Deanna and others uh, have re are really interested in the Coyote and Crow concept, even to the point of, you know, they would buy fiction in that world. The concept <laughs> of the universe that they have designed seems so interesting on its own. Um, Ryan is mentioning Wilderness War or Navajo Wars. Yeah, GMT Games, you're looking at non- uh, non-native designers, both uh, of them. And Jeff is asking, no dog-eat-dog dog on the list. 
Uh, from what I understand, Dog Eat Dog is not. Also, it's about colonialism and its consequences, but I do not think. Maybe it belongs on the honorable mentions. I'm trying to see if I can find more info on that one right now. It did not come up on the, my research, but maybe it's one we can eat, add to the list. Uh, we are looking quick. Uh, Jeff is really interested in finding out why the people behind Coyote and Crow decided to use fists full of D12s for their <laughs> I game. I don't know. Uh, which is definitely a, 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 you know, an experienced RPG type uh, mechanic. Um, All right, so the designers of Dog Eat Dog are Hawaiian, which I don't know if they're Hawaiian indigenous or if they're Hawaiian settlers, right? right. So it is two brothers that made the game, Liam and William Burke. Um, they said, as far as I can tell, they are not actually Indi indigenous designers. But it is a, st a story of natives on a Pacific island. So there's definitely it has the theme. Like I said there were there are plenty of games with the theme, indigenous themes. All right, so Jeff is saying they are indigenous. So thank you for finding that. I unfortunately didn't find that during my research. So yeah, we'll toss that onto the blog version of this post, and we'll make sure to toss a link in the show notes. Right. And Ryan's mentioning that the Coyote and Crow Project creators did answer the question of D12s somewhere, but uh, not quite sure where, and that 12 is an important number in the setting. Um, oh, there you go. That uh -huh. makes sense. I was uh, There was uh, some interesting information I, when I was reading up on uh i don't even want to try and pronounce it again uh fighting was it fighting serpents or no it was uh patoli um apparently part of the the board layout was interested was mayan uh number theory basically I and mean, mines were, okay. were big into numbers all along that's where we got that whole 2012 confusion back back in the day right right um but yeah that, so the, the number of spaces and things had all sorts of significance. And apparently there was even possibly, and again, this is, you know, looking back through um, researchers' eyes, but uh, possibly some prediction mechanisms that were being used uh, in a religious ceremony using the same board as the game. So doing, doing double duty there. Interesting. Well, that would make sense why I, like, there were reports of people having carved that one in different mm -hmm. places, too. So, yes, the designer of uh, Wilderness War is a CIA national security analyst who wrote board games about history and is in absolutely no way indigenous. <laughs> um, Navajo Wars, I know for sure, is also the same thing. Right. Um, that's I, In Navajo War, there's a follow-up to that, Comanche or something like that. Again, games about indigenous tribes. I don't know enough about them to know if they were handled well or not. I know when, when Daki came out, there was a lot of pushback over the images on the cover, not actually matching anything that would semblance to the Wendaki tribe. And then they were asked if they had consulted, and I think what they did is the publishers then went back and did some consulting and republished, but I'm not positive on that. But again, original designers were not indigenous. Right. All right, so the big thing I'm seeing is people want to play these. <laughs> that, that is the main thing I am seeing, plus uh, complaints about our video quality tonight, which I apologize. We have the boss, best possible internet we can get in our area, and I don't know what I can do to make it better. I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's you. I don't know if it's me. Um Literally, I will not be putting this up on YouTube unless I can sync the audio from Audacity to it. All right. Well, that's that's terrible to hear. So I think it was a very worthwhile topic. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm 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 definitely going to try and sync the audio. Yeah. So I I'm not saying it's not possible, but uh, the give it it's going to look a little weird, and hopefully it'll sound good if it goes up on uh, there. Because yeah, it's there was a lot of uh, drop. Yeah, that's bad. So Deanna says, uh, given the gambling excess, I wonder if someone carved into the beam of a house because they won the house or the land it was on. That's fair. I could see that. And yes, and Deanna totally wants to play these. <laughs> uh, the, the abstract ones all look solid. Like, the, well, the fact people are still playing them now and they're from the year 600, one of them, mm -hmm. that's a good indicator, right? <laughs> Sadly, I, I will admit, I have not played a single game on this list except Liar's Dice, which I have to assume has changed a bit. I definitely didn't. My copy didn't come with beans. 
<laughs> All right, I think we are good to move on. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. <laughs> 